and peace bring it all to peace the storm surrounding me let it break at your name peace bring it all to peace the storm surrounding me let it break at your name jesus jesus you make the darkness tremble jesus jesus you silence fear jesus jesus you make the darkness tremble jesus jesus and breathe call these bones to live call these lungs to sing once again and i will pray to sing once again I will praise Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus you silence fear Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus
judge the world high and low They try to fail a burning desire They'll never find enough gold Many are searching for faith New things that always decay Man's empty praise will fade away But Jesus, your love will remain I'd rather give you all the glory I'd rather give you all my praise For your love and grace Your goodness and mercy They follow me all of my turning to heaven Lives that were lost are renewed Jesus you've spoken The curse is now broken And all of the praise goes to you I'd rather give you all the glory I'd rather give you all my praise your love and grace, your goodness and mercy, they follow me all of my days. I'd rather give you all the glory. I'd rather give you all my praise. For your love and grace, your goodness and mercy, they follow me all of my and mercy they follow me all of my Caught up in this holy 
sworn you and nothing else, and nothing else, and nothing else will do. And I'll just warn you, nothing else. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified died and was buried and descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Kilda, no my heart and my and welcome along to online church it is such a blessing to have you this morning this morning we have one of my favorite preachers preaching to you his name is mark proctor i really want to encourage you that the goodness of god is there for you to behold so let us be people who press into the word of god and to seek what it is he wants us to connect with today here's the message good morning church uh this morning uh, i get the privilege of speaking and and we're just we're going to go through some stuff in the Old Testament, you know, first half of the Bible. Uh, we're going to start in Exodus, go through a couple of deep dives, uh, mainly in the areas of clothes, blood, and salt. You know, the classic trio that you find everywhere: clothes, blood, and salt. It's going to be great. Um, yeah. The the great thing though is that these things are they're very simple, but they've got a whole lot of depth to them, and it's that's it's kind of it's true of God really. He makes things just really simple. But there's so much depth to it that we can just explore them more and we can do so much more with it. It's not like, uh, I don't know if you remember at high school, um, where they tell you things one year and then the next year they say, oh, jokes, actually, uh, I know we said that electrons are kind of in, in valency shells, but actually they can be anywhere. 
out. Those are just things that we tell you, your weak little minds, so that you can um, start to understand these big, complex subjects. Um, yeah, anyone else still dark about that? It's been at least 10 years. Um, yeah. But thankfully with God, the deeper you go, the more you reinforce the basics. And that, that's just such a great equalizer. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how gifted you are in so many areas. We're all on the same level before Jesus. You don't start with John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, uh, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. You don't start with that and then say, Oh, you know, that's what we teach the kids. Uh, but actually, let me tell you about all this stuff, which is uh, advanced Christian thinking. Um, which actually is how cults start and how you lead to heresy. Um, as the great Irenaeus, uh, second century theologian, said uh, that originality is the last thing that should be expected from someone thinking about God. Uh, yeah. Advanced thinking, advanced Christian thinking is just more of Jesus, thankfully. Jesus is the starting point, and he's also the end. He isn't the face of Christianity or the front man, or he is, but he's not just that. He is and always will be the way, the truth, and the life. You start learning about God's love through Jesus. And as you go on, you learn, you experience how wide and how deep and how high his love really is. You, you see the details about how God, how this great this God is who speaks life into being, how, how much hurt he endures when us, his creation, reject him time and again and again and again. How faithful and kind he is to still want a relationship with us, sacrificing himself to free us from our sin. And the details, they add more and more beauty to the picture of who God is. They add more depth to his character, and they portray the vast expanse of his mercy. So let's get into some details. We'll, uh, we're going to start with Exodus chapter 28. Um, and it's one of those passages you kind of read about February. Um, not really this time of year. You read in February, just after deciding in January that this is going to be the year I'm going to read through the Bible. And uh, you start it well. You uh, get through Genesis, stories of Abraham, Exodus, Moses. Then you hit kind of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. And after that, it's just lists and details and tabernacle and priests and covenants and just things that are so dry and so hard to get any encouragement out of. And maybe you forget about it for a month or five and you start again next year. But anyway, here we are in Exodus 28. Let's, let's, let's look at this in terms of clothes, blood and salt. Um, it's just after God's people have crossed the Red Sea uh, under Moses. They're ready to become the nation of Israel. They've been slaves their whole lives. So they don't know how to live freely. It's all about, uh, this chapter 28 is all about Moses and his brother Aaron, how Aaron and his sons get consecrated and made ready for priestly duty in the tabernacle, in, uh, in the tent where God dwells with his people. So let's start at verse 31. Make the robe that is worn with the ephod, which is a special sleeveless robe, from a single piece of blue cloth, with an opening for Aaron's head in the middle of it, Reinforce the opening with a woven collar so it will not tear. It's good, nice and practical. Uh, make pomegranates out of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and attach them to the hem of the robe with gold bells between them. The gold bells and pomegranates are to alternate all around the hem. Aaron will wear this robe whenever he ministers before the Lord and the bells will tinkle as he goes in and out of the Lord's presence in the holy place. If he wears it, he will not die. Next, make a medallion of pure gold and engrave it like a seal with these whole words, Holy to the Lord. Attach the medallion with a blue cord to the front of Aaron's turban where it must remain. Aaron must wear it on his forehead so that he may take on himself any guilt of the people of Israel when they consecrate their sacred offerings. He must always wear it on his forehead so the Lord will accept the people. Weave Aaron's patterned tunic from fine linen cloth. Fashion the turban from this linen as well. Also make a sash and decorate it with colourful embroidery. For Aaron's sons, make tunics, sashes and special head coverings that are glorious and beautiful. Clothe your brother Aaron and his sons with these garments and then anoint and ordain them. Consecrate them so they can serve as my priests. Also make linen undergarments for them to be worn next to their bodies, reaching from their hips to their thighs. 
These must be worn whenever Aaron and his sons enter to the tabernacle or approach the altar in the holy place to perform their priestly duties. Then they will not incur guilt and die. This is the permanent law for Aaron and all his descendants after him. But, um, the passage starts out so well with glorious and beautiful clothes. We have the high priest dripping with his bling and his swish get up and... Uh, then we get details for his sons, and then it casually mentions a couple of times that if they forget to wear their underwear or their tinkly bells in the holy place, they'll die. Kind of seems a bit serious, don't you think? Well, spoiler alert, it turns out uh, the next book in the Bible, about Leviticus chapter 10, uh, two of Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, um, they do something wrong in the holy place. They offer unauthorized fire, and it's not really clear about what they did wrong, but um, but they die instantly. Um, you know how sometimes someone makes a mistake at work and then all of a sudden there has to be a whole lot of meetings and, and suddenly there's new rules after that? Well, we can kind of infer from the rules that Moses puts into place afterwards uh, what happened with, with Aaron's sons. And they talk about, um, got to have your hair combed, got to do this, kind of be, 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 be a bit more special. And then uh, they kind of summarize it in saying that they didn't distinguish between the holy and the common. The Aaron's two sons, when they died, they treated God's tabernacle, God's presence, like it was any old tent. And so they died. And there are other places in the Bible where God kills someone instantly. It always seems pretty harsh. Uh, but I guess God, I, I guess he's really serious about sin and treating holy things with respect. And sin is, is any thought or action that falls short of God's standards. And by that definition, uh, so, oh, so sometimes, sometimes do, sinning is, is not doing enough good or, or, not, or, um, or doing bad things or not doing, um, not doing good. And by that definition, we've all sinned. None of us can be perfect. And therefore, none of us can, by ourselves, rightly stand in God's presence. God's serious about sin. And this... This is the same God who so loved the world that he sent his only son. It's not like Jesus is the loving one, God's the serious one, and the Holy Spirit's the crazy one. No, it's the three persons of the Trinity are the same being, the same substance, all crazy, all serious, all loving. And it's so easy in churches like ours where we often focus on the love of God, and rightly so, but sometimes we forget how holy and how completely other God is, how serious he is about sin. So let's read ahead a little bit. Let's uh, skip ahead a chapter to Exodus 29 where God talks about the process of how these priests and their glorious and beautiful robes are consecrated for serving on the tabernacle. Because um, it's not how I would have done it. I would have you know, got them ready in their nice gear and then done some little, maybe sprinkled flowers or some nice perfume or something on them so that they're ready to stand before God. Um, Pretty much, they, there's a lot of blood and guts. Um, and I'm going to skip here to 19 so you get the idea. Uh, now take the other ram, because I've already done the same to one ram and a bull, and have Aaron and his sons lay their hands on its head, then slaughter it and apply some of its blood to the right earlobes of Aaron and his sons. Also put it on the thumbs of their right hands and the big toes of their right feet. Splatter the rest of the blood against all the sides of the altar, and then take some of the blood from the altar and some of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and his sons and on their garments. In this way, they and their garments will be set apart as holy. They take the glorious and beautiful clothes that someone spent hours making and they splatter blood all over it. According to that last verse, the priests standing there in their special garments aren't ready to serve God unless they have this blood splattered on them. It's that final touch that makes them holy. And usually when I think of God's holy priests or Aaron and his sons or, you know, if you're going to Google um, kind of priests of the tabernacle or anything, um, you tend to think, picture something like a modern day bishop or a monk. They'd just be standing there all holy-like, not really doing anything. They might be saying something holy, but they're generally all clean. You don't see any pictures with this blood on it. And um, in reality, Israelite priests, they're more like butchers and barbecuers than monks or bishops. Uh, one of the main functions is to take animals from the people. Uh, they slaughter them right there. They lift them onto this big bronze altar 
and add a bit of salt. Yes, that's right. God commands that the priest add salt to the meat that goes on the altar. Leviticus 2.13 mentions it for grain offerings and then Ezekiel 43.24 for meat um, as God's reinstating the priesthood under Ezekiel uh, or through Ezekiel. Uh, the priests kill the animals, they add salt and they put them on the altar. They also burn grain offerings, which are kind of like a, a flatbread. Um, and there's also drink offerings of wine somewhere in there as well. Tell me this isn't like a barbecue. Sometimes the priests let the sacrifice burn to ashes and sometimes I share of it together as a meal. Suddenly, when you put all these pieces together, this ancient sacred text starts to sound a little bit more normal. But it's not just a common barbecue. It's a holy barbecue. We must distinguish between the holy and the common. We can't be like uh, Nadab and Abihu, because we can't forget that just a few meters away, there's this massive glory cloud of God's presence, you know, the type that you can't just ignore, um, the type that causes people to die if they get too familiar, not to mention all the blood on the ground. But the main question is why? Why all this killing? Why all this blood? It's because God wanted his people to be reminded every day, everywhere, that for God, the life giver, to dwell with his people, for their people to have their sin dealt with so that they can enjoy the blessing of his presence, and to be a part of the promises that God made to Abraham, something has to die. He didn't want them to miss out or forget. He didn't want them to miss it. He didn't want them to forget that they didn't earn this relationship as being God's people. They didn't earn his favor. Something else paid with its life. Something had to die. Every animal skin, every drop of blood, uh, even what they make the tabernacle out of, even the smell of the place would all have reinforced that idea. As the consequences of sin is always death, it takes a sacrifice of life to deal with sin. Something had to die so that God could dwell with his people. And as this isn't new to Exodus, in fact, when Adam and Eve first sinned back in Genesis 3, God said, you know, eat from anything, just not that tree, don't do it, you'll die. They did it, they ate the forbidden fruit, and um, they didn't die, not right then. God provided, God told them the consequences of their actions. He cursed them, and then he provided an animal to die so that they could have clothes. Animal skins that covered Adam and Eve's guilt and shame. It's not just that the, whatever leaves Adam and Eve rustled up weren't big enough or warm enough or they weren't God's style. God was introducing the concept of sacrifice. And God knew right from the start that all of these sacrifices would never be enough. Even if the priests were faithful in their jobs, year in and year out, which they weren't, by the way, it would never be enough. All of the killing, all the bleeding, all the burning, all the sacrificial system does is keep the effects of sin at bay. It covers sin temporarily. It doesn't deal with it properly. And so God has sent his son, his only son, who came to earth. The king of kings was born in a donkey's feed trough to a poor couple. Jesus grew and he laughed and he ate and he slept and he walked and he hugged and he wept and he showed us what God is like. He offered himself as the perfect sacrifice. The perfect sacrifice once and for all, knowing full well that something had to pay. Something had to die so that God's people could dwell with him, so that sin could be dealt with once and for all, so that we could be made whole. And God is still as serious about sin as he ever was. He still insists that we distinguish between the holy and the common. You can uh, read up on Ananias and Sapphira in, in the book of Acts if you want. Uh, but the difference now is that because of Jesus, we have been made holy. So when God is protective of treating holy things with respect, that means you and me. When we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, when we live for him, we come under his covering. I had a book uh, by Charles Spurgeon, who's this renowned preacher from quite a while ago, um, called The Key to Holiness. And I had it sitting on my shelf for lots and lots and lots of years because uh, I thought I knew what it was about. I just thought key to holiness is do this, do this, do this, don't do this, uh, do this, and you're holy. Um, I finally started reading it. Uh, a while back, and, and the first three quarters of the book, at least, was all about 
not do this, do this. It was Jesus has done this for you. He's 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 done this. And this is what it means. He's done this for you. And then the last little bit was in light of all this, how can we not give him everything who has given everything to us? How can we not join in with what he's doing? How can we not be a part, you know, put our little two cents in with when he's given us everything? If you are holy, it's not because of anything you've done, but by what Jesus has done, the free gift of grace that is available to all. As Christians, we're no better than anyone else in trying to separate ourselves or create a holy club. It goes against the biblical example of holiness. God gets amongst all the blood and pain, and he takes our burdens on himself. He makes it his problem, and we are called to follow his example. Jesus is not only the perfect sacrifice, he's the true high priest. And the book of Hebrews goes into that in great length. But Aaron had to have the blood of bulls and rams on his outfit before he was ready. But the blood that completes Jesus' priestly robe is his own. He doesn't need bells to stay alive. He's complete without sin. He's completely without sin. It's good news that the high priest that represents you and me before God is not only willing to die for you, he already has. So Jesus is the... He's the sacrifice, but he's also the high priest. Um, who are we? Um, well, we're, we're, it's kind of unclear. I haven't really read, read too many commentaries that go this much in, in depth on, on this, but we're a combination of the priests and the salt. Jesus said uh, in Matthew that, that we are the salt of the earth. And then in First Peter, um, Peter says that we are a royal priesthood. And there's also a connection in Numbers 18 and 19 between priesthood and a covenant of salt. And so as the priests, we have garments. They have garments made for them, covered in the blood of the sacrifice. So we are called to put on the robe of righteousness and a garment of praise. As the priests enjoy a portion of the sacrifice, we take communion with, with the bread and wine being Jesus' body and blood. And when it comes to it doesn't matter what kind of stain you may have made in your life. There's nothing that Jesus' blood can't cover. There's no stain that can outstain the blood of Jesus. And in the same way as throwing salt on a fire would do nothing by itself. It would not be acceptable at any barbecue and definitely not at, at, in front of God. We would be nothing without Jesus. But as we join with him, as we abandon being the boss of our own lives and we follow Jesus, as we become the salt on the altar of his sacrifice, we bring out the flavor of Jesus to those around us. I'll say that again, as we abandon being the boss of our own lives, as we follow Jesus, as we become the salt on the altar of his sacrifice, we bring out the flavor of Jesus to those around us. So I've got some questions uh, that I want you to consider just before we head on to the next part of the service. Number one, are you covered by the blood of Jesus? Are you holy or are you common? None of us are holy in ourselves. It's only through accepting what Jesus has done and believing that he's the perfect sacrifice, the son of God, gratefully surrendering our lives to him that we become holy. And if you haven't made that decision yet, but you'd like to, and I say, don't wait, there's never any better time than now. May I suggest talk to someone about it, They'll, um, or leave comments or anything. Second question is, if you know that you are holy, if you have been set apart, are you living out that decision? Are you the salt on Jesus' sacrifice? Do you enhance the flavor of Jesus to those around you? Or have you lost your saltiness? And to those people, I'd say take a moment to connect, reconnect with God. That can be just right now where you're sitting or, or just before you go to bed tonight, any time. Be open and honest because he already knows you. He already knows exactly what's going on and he already accepts you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you that you are, have made us perfect, that you have adorned us with your, 
your priestly robes covered in the blood of Jesus that that does so much more for us than we can ever that we can ever hope or imagine that you have made us holy that the stain of your blood Jesus covers over everything in our lives and makes us perfect and thank you so much so that we get to be a part of of your sacrifice we get to be a part of what you're doing in this world that we can bring out the, your flavor to those around us Lord that those we pray that those that come again um, we pray that those that we see would see, taste and see that you are good in everything we do in Holy Spirit we ask your help and my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my savior on that cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears They laid him down in Joseph's tomb The ancient seal by heavy stone Messiah still
It is such a blessing to be a giver. God is a giver. He taught us what it looked like to have a lifestyle of giving. And so we want to present you with an opportunity to give this morning. Uh, you can give of your time through signing up to serve in one of our in-person services uh, or even with our online service team somehow. Uh, get in touch with us if you would like to, to give in that way. But if you would like to give financially, we also wanted to give you that option. Uh, if you are at the moment struggling financially, please do not feel pressured to give. Uh, it is not a requirement of our faith. Um, it is something that we want to we want to give you as an opportunity. Uh, and so you can give via our website at www.elamdunedin.com. So I hope you were blessed by the service like I know I have been. Uh, it is awesome to be able to connect with you guys each and every week here at Online Church. I want to encourage you to connect with us. You can connect with us via commenting on our, on our streams. Uh, you can private message us here on Facebook uh, or you can send us an email via our website. Uh, so please get in touch with us. We'd love to hear about what God has been doing in your life through Online Church. We love hearing testimonies of the good things God has done already with our online service, our whānau who are out there. We've had people connect with God for the first time. We've seen people grow in their faith. Uh, and so we would love to hear more of those stories so we can share them with the rest of our online church whānau uh, and hear what is going on with you. Uh, if you want to come along to one of our in-person services, I really want to encourage you. This is an excellent way to connect with the body of God. Uh, you can come to our um, in-person services at 6 67 Harrow Street here in Dunedin. If you're in a different city in Aotearoa, Kei Te Pai, there are a bunch of amazing churches uh, that we love all across New Zealand. So if you don't know one, you can get in touch with us and we can hook you up with an awesome church to get along to. Um, maybe today something that Mark shared uh, really impacted you. Maybe it was about whether or not that you, are, you have the blood of Christ on you. Uh, if you need to connect with someone to talk further about these things, uh, we really want to encourage that as well. So please get in touch if you want to connect further about something that has touched you today or something that even just brought up a question to you. Uh, I would definitely pass on those questions to Mark. So if you need to do that, please get in touch with us as soon as possible. I would love to uh, send you off with a bit of a blessing. Kia tau, kia tātou katoa, te atawhai o tō tātou ariki ko ihu kraiti, me te aroha o te atua, me te whiwhinga tahitanga ki te wairua tapu. Āmine.